So um, we have a couple different uh, co-leaders here. So Sebastian Sosel, uh, myself, Brian Liverman, Patrick Marino, and Jeff Hess. So we helped get the entire Northern Virginia Tableau group going. And um, some of you might have seen us uh, way back in our very first meeting back in I guess it was 2020, beginning of 2020, when we were allowed to all see each other. So um, hopefully we'll be seeing each other again soon, but we figured we'd do one more, at least one more virtual meeting um, in today's wonderful COVID world. So um, here's today's agenda, and please let me know if anybody has not seen the screen, but I believe it's working fine. So uh, we're just doing our little welcome and updates portion right now. And um, after that, uh, maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes, however long it takes us to go through this section here. We'll uh, jump over to our first presenter uh, to Rip and have him do his presentation. And after Rip, we'll go to uh, our other co-leader, Jeff, who um, will do a presentation and um, sat there. And I believe Jeff, uh, I provided a link to the um, file that Jeff will be using. So if you did not open that yet, and if you can, feel free to jump out to that uh, follow-up email, I believe, that I sent out that has uh, the link to it. So jump over and grab that and maybe put on your other screen if you have two screens um, or three, like me. Um, so we'll do that. And then we'll do some follow-up and any uh, wrap-up uh, items or questions and so forth that you might have for any of us um, at the end of the meeting. So um, feel free to, unless the presenter's mind, feel free to um, ask questions. Um, I believe you can do a chat feature on here as well. We'll try to keep an eye on that. Um, if you want to pipe in and ask a question during the presentation, unless the presenters tell us uh, later that they prefer you to wait, then I, I don't see a problem with it, but uh, go by what they prefer. So let's jump over to our happenings. Um, so we're going to kind of try to keep with our same uh, cadence of meetings of every couple of months, uh, not quite quarterly, but almost quarterly, if you will. And so it looks like July-ish would be our next meeting. And I was thinking maybe we could try to do one in person. So we'll maybe put a feeler out there for how people feel on that. And then, of course, depending on where we could meet that would allow us to have uh, folks come in person. So we'll go from there. We'll keep you posted on it as we've uh, tended to do. Um, go to the splash page that you get on the link. That'll give you updates as we make them. And then um, I didn't put it on here, but I'll try to see if I can find it and add it later. But our LinkedIn page. So if you look for Nova Tug or Northern Virginia Tableau User Group um, in LinkedIn, you'll find us and we try to put our updates on there as well. So you have uh, an idea of what we're doing. And uh, this session is being recorded. We try to record all of our sessions. Um, so if you know folks that miss it or if you got to cut out early, uh, um, for any reason, um, or you just want to go back and catch something uh, that you heard or saw, uh, feel free to do so. So we'll put that link up on the LinkedIn page, and um, we'll also um, send that out in an email as well. So you'll get that probably from me or from Jeff, most likely. So um, there is apparently a solution engineer position available supporting the uh, FSI space uh, with uh, Tableau and looking for a job opportunity. That's a one that you might want to take a look at. Um, there is also a, a link here. You can't obviously get to it through the, the screen here, but if you can take a quick note um, or catch back up on the live recording, we have a link to the recorded session from the Tableau uh, live event that occurred last week. So that is this link um, that you see right here. Um, hopefully my cursor is showing. If not, I'm showing to myself. <laughs> um, also, if uh, anybody's interested in looking for positions with um, Volkswagen, Audi, or any of our other uh, multiple subsidiaries uh, that are part of the, the group of companies, uh, feel free to reach out to any of us in regards to that. There are some uh, open today that do look for Tableau skills, but they're not Tableau specific, um, such as my position. I use Tableau in my position, but it's not a Tableau specific position. But uh, we love working here. So if you're interested, uh, reach out to any of us and let us know. We'll be happy to try to uh, help you out in that process. And if we don't see you before July 4th, I figured I'd throw in a happy July 4th. Hopefully we can have some folks getting together in person and uh, all that good stuff. So I'm going to stop a second here. So we usually have an opportunities, needs, and news uh, point at uh, this spot in our meeting. And if you have something you want to present on yourself, uh, indicate you're looking for position or you have positions open, and you want to uh, announce something on that, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, jump on and we'll then get started after that. So I'll be quiet and listen.
my cat has gotten bored with everything. She's turned her back on me at the moment. So if you can see her, that's, that's her. <laughs> Okay, so if we don't have any announcements or opportunities and anybody wants to speak at this time, it's fine. You can bring it up at the end as well, um, or you can reach out to us individually. Um, so you can do that through the LinkedIn page is probably the best way, or if you respond to one of the um, invites that we send out, um, that'll come to us as well. So we can reach back out to you that way. So I will go ahead and get us on to our first section, which will be, um, presentation by Rip Stiffer. And let me give you a little slide here on Rip. Um, he's gonna, he's from Woodside Quality LLC and he's gonna do a presentation on digging for fraud with Tableau on Binford's Law. So I will be quiet and I'm gonna um, stop sharing my screen and allow um, Rip to go ahead and share his. And Rip, I will also mute myself and go hide for a little while while I listen and watch. <laughs> Thank you, welcome. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, sir. Perfect. I was speaking on mute there for a second. Um, <laughs> I was going to just tell you that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, trying to juggle a few too many things here at the end of kind of a long day. So um, I'm Rip Stoffer. I'm CEO and senior consultant for Woodside Quality LLC. We're mostly a quality Six Sigma lean type uh, consulting company. Uh, my expertise is in statistical methods for quality control. I have a master's in that, and I'm pushing for a DBA and currently enrolled in a program for a DBA in uh, supply chain. But most of my work has been in TQM, statistical process control, Six Sigma, Lean, Six Sigma, and stochastic modeling. I'm also part of the adjunct faculty at Walden University. I teach business statistics and a data visualization, data-based decision-making class that I wrote a few years ago, based on Stephen Few and Colin Ware, and uh, of course, Tufty. Um, I've got Master Black Belt, Quality Engineer, and a couple other ASQ certifications. So I've been doing this for a little while. Um, just a note on my Tableau, if you want to call it expertise, I, I was getting to be pretty good for a while there. I, I started out several years ago as a click developer. I don't know if any of you have used ClickView, but I uh, took several classes with another consulting company that I was where I was working and learned to be a click developer. And my son kept telling me, you've got to shift to Tableau because he was working two or three different jobs out of college where they were using Tableau and he kept telling me what a great tool it was. So I finally broke down and, and got a copy of my own and started playing with it. And it was, you know, quantum leap better. Um, and I did pretty well for a while. I, I worked at one government agency that was using Tableau. I was able to build dashboards and generate a lot of enthusiasm there. I uh, got another contract a couple of years ago with another agency and we started out using Tableau there. And I went through all the training, got just to the point where I was going to invest the money to get certified. And they changed leadership at this agency and decided um, they wanted to go with Power BI. So we ended up having to shift everything over to Power BI, which is hopefully none of you ever have to go through that because it's really, you know, doing a whole lot more work to be able to show a whole lot less results. Um, but it, it's been an interesting transition, but I really wish they'd go back to Tableau. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. References for this particular presentation um, are the actual paper that Benford wrote in 38 and a paper that Newcomb wrote in, in 1881. He was actually the person who discovered Benford's law, but I guess Benford was just more popular. Interestingly, in the Benford paper, it doesn't even, um, Cite Newcomb, but citations were a lot sketchier in 1938 than they are now. Um, and then Triola Elementary Statistics 
that was the textbook that I used when I taught the MBA course at Walden several years ago. And we actually did a whole week on, on Benford's Law just because it's kind of an interesting thing. A little bit of history. Um, Simon Newcomb observed that 10 digits don't occur with equal frequency must be evident to anyone making much use of logarithmic tables. Now he noticed it in his logarithmic tables because in 1881, if you were gonna do logarithms, you had to use these big books of tables. And he noticed that, you know, the ones seemed to be thumbed and, and used a whole lot more than the twos and the threes and so on. And as you get into the higher numbers, the, the wear on the pages was smaller. So he began to look at this and, and found that in general, there's, there's a pretty well-defined distribution for, for some numbers. And then, you know, the basic of, basis of it is that the first significant figure is oftener one than any other digit. Um, in 38, Benford did some more studies on this, compiled 20,000 first digits and showed that there was a logarithmic distribution. And he actually went on to codify it um, in a formula. So, is it Benford's law or is it Newcomb's law? Well, Newcomb actually discovered it first, but apparently Newcomb wasn't very popular and Benford's work was a lot more comprehensive. Generally referred to in most stats textbooks as Benford's law, but there are, there are a few that, that I guess are a little more purist and call it the Benford-Newcomb law. A few examples from Benford, rivers, populations, constants, pressure, drainage, all of these things tend to have that pattern that one occurs more frequently than two, two occurs more frequently than three, three occurs more frequently than four, et cetera. And one of the practical uses of this is when people are cooking the books, um, what they tend to do is not know this law and, and they'll try to they'll try to uh, randomize the numbers. So you'll have about as many ones as twos, about as many twos as fours, fours as sixes and so on. Um, and so Benford's law turns out to be a pretty practical way to at least find fraud where people don't know about the law. Now, of course, a really smart accountant who's taken a lot of statistics classes and has heard about Benford's law might use it to their advantage to try to cover it up, but um, those are kind of few and far between. So this is the general expression for the um, for the law itself, the mathematical expression. Um, these are the the uh, observed frequencies and the actual logarithmic intervals. So you can see the logarithm the logarithm. Uh, that algorithm covers it pretty well. Um, these are the observed frequencies from the 20,000 observations that he had. So they're pretty, pretty tight. So onward. Um, I had taught this in that master, master statistics course, had my training as a quick view developer. And uh, I told, as I told you, I was introduced to Tableau by my son. Um, became a convert and began working for another company in 2015, building Tableau dashboards for the CFO of this one agency. Um, in 2017, my, my BDO called me up and said, hey, look, we, we've got this other agency and they're interested in working with us, but uh, I've been doing a sort of a side project with them on fraud, waste and abuse. Can you um, give me an example of how we might say use Tableau to help uncover some of the fraud, waste and abuse in this agency? And so I spent a weekend as proof of concept um, putting this together. Um, with fraud detection, what I needed was I needed to get data from a, a government organization. I needed to get real data, obviously, this organization wasn't going to give me any of their data when we were just trying to show proof of concept. So I went out on the internet and looked for real data, financial data, and it had to be from public records that were available on the internet because 
well, I'll talk about in just a couple minutes. What I found was financial records for a city and what it was was spending on, on public projects. And they had put their, they've got all their data right out on the, on the web. Now, a couple of just one note on this. Um, a few weeks ago when, when I, Brian and I first started talking about, I guess it was a couple months ago now, when um, I offered this to Brian as a possible presentation for one of these meetings, he said, um, or he didn't say anything, but I thought that it might be a good idea for me to go to the, the city itself and say, by the way, I have, I have this data and this presentation. I'm going to give a presentation on your data and I wonder if you mind. And I talked to the comptroller of the city and she was fascinated. She had me send her a link to the uh, free Tableau reader and a copy of the Twivix file. So I sent her the Twivix and the uh, free Tableau reader and she was gonna go through it. I had walked her through it in a Zoom meeting um, and she was pretty fascinated by it. And I asked her if she minded if I presented it. And she said, no, not at all. The data was still there. And she said that the data are actually updated. Although I went and grabbed a, a copy of the supposedly updated file and it was exactly the same as the one that I had used a couple of years before. Um, so I got some city financial records. It's a, it's a, you know, that's not very good. The population is 200,000. It's a, it's a Southern city. Um, oh, we're skipping ahead here. This is where I'm supposed to stop presenting and move on to the Tableau dashboard itself. So I don't want to stop my share. I want to stop this and I want to bring up Tableau and drag it over here. So this is the Benford's Law presentation that I have and what what you see here is these are the bars that show the actual data. And this is all the data. This is for all departments from this city. Um, and I can filter it by purchasing agent and I can filter it by vendor number because these were some of the fields that they had in their data set. The, um, so the bars represent the actual observed data. The lines up here, the dark line, the black line, actually shows what the, um, the Benford's Law number is. So you saw that before the observed number was 0 0.301. Um, this is 0 0.1671. This is the percent of numbers in this data set that start with one, two, three, four, five, and six. The black line shows what Benford actually is. And I just sort of arbitrarily, and because it's roughly around two sigma, um, I threw a, a plus or minus 5% on here. 5%, no, 15%. Plus or minus 15% around each one. So the theory is here that if I look at these different um, areas and they're all within these lighter blue bands, that they probably, they're very close to Benford's Law or dead on Benford's Law. Now here I have a couple of things that aren't really in the blue bands, but I'm not overly worried about something that's, that's just a little bit outside. Um, and so what you can do is, is, is look through here and see some of the other, uh, some of the other things, some of the other things don't even have any data. But where we do have them, okay, here's a good one. This one is, is kind of sketchy maybe. You know, I don't wanna accuse anybody of fraud. I've, I've often thought maybe I should call this city um, and go down there and, and maybe show them this. The comptroller said uh, she might be interested in having that happen. Human resources doesn't look great. They're all ones, twos, and threes. But you know, there there can be reasons why why some of these are um, some of these show up this way. There may be things that they purchase. Wow. Oh, I know what's going on. I don't want. 
one all. There we go. I had purchasing agents set to one particular purchasing agent. So this is with all purchasing agents. And you can see registrar of voters, maybe a few too many twos, no fours, no sixes or sevens. Um, and that's out of 436 total items with a total amount of $269,934. Uh, where was another pretty good one? Was it the library? Library was pretty good. Library generally follows the distribution. It's got a couple of things that are a little bit sketchy, but I, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't spend time investigating the library board of control at all. Um, let me look at fire and see fire and, and police. Uh, well, they're mostly ones, but none of their, none of their things get spent anywhere else. However, when you look up here, they only, they only bought 24 items. So it's not hard to imagine that in buying 24 items, you'd have purchase orders, most of which started with one and a handful of fives and not too many other numbers. That's just an awful lot of stuff there. Planning Commission doesn't look real bad. Um, there was one here I thought was pretty good. Now the roads were good. Uh, downtown development. Downtown development to me doesn't look great. Um, especially with 888 items. They have an awful lot of items that start with a five. And I, I guess, you know, when you're talking about these, these are actual purchase orders. So um, one of the reasons that I was glad to find purchase order stuff is that with purchase orders, you, uh, you're able to find fraud because of the, that's where a lot of fraud happens is in, in buying things for government. So here I can look at it by purchasing agent, which we already kind of did. CB looked a little sketchy on a couple of things. Um, I don't have actual names. This one um, looks at it slightly differently. These are by cost control, general ledger numbers um, and program. So we can look at general ledger accounts and you would hope that in the general ledger, you don't see a whole lot of this. Um, and they generally do look pretty good. So apparently- hey, Rip, We got a question in the chat just to confirm if you're analyzing the first digit or all digits. First digit. So if it's $10,000, it starts with a one. If it's you know, $20,000, it starts with a two. Um, if you take a checkbook or any general ledger, the, the numbers will generally follow. And this, you know, when you look through the general ledger here, it, it all looks pretty good. So their, their accounts are either really good. This again, only has 14 items. So their accountants are, are really honest or they already know about Benford. Um, yeah, when you look at appropriations used, that looks really good. So the general ledger looks very good. I threw in a couple of more things here. Um, this is just the view that informs this particular view. Um, but I also thought they might, whoops, they might want to look at trends over time um, to see when the money was spent. So if they find some weird things out here in the department and vendor, they might want to look at that same department, this is Department of Transportation um, to see where the money was actually spent or when the money was actually spent rather. And that's really, I mean, this is not a complex dashboard. I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm sorry about that, but I just thought it was such a great um, sort of a useful thing for people to know that they can build something like this that they can use to, to hunt for fraud. Um, you see something like this, you're, you're not gonna suspect any of the, any of the accountants. 
but you might suspect some of these department heads when they have some of these strange strange spending patterns. Um, where was that? There was one that was pretty bad. Well, anyway, oh, here we go. This was 614 items. So that's kind of a lot of items to have this far out of the distribution. Any questions? I mean, I know this was quick and down and dirty, but I, I just wanted to show this, this one pretty I have powerful. a quick question. Sure. So it looks like the more values or items you have, the better the analysis is. So is there a recommendation? Like if you have only 10 items to analyze, then maybe this is not a good candidate for this technique to detect fraud? Yeah, yeah, that's very, that's really a good question, really good observation, sure. And it, I mean, isn't that true of just about any statistical um, statistical analysis that you do, you always want more data. I'm a statistician, I'm always starved for more data. Right, and right. But is, this, is there a certain number, you know? Um, or a certain percentage or something? No, I don't, well, so <laughs> probably anything less than 100, you might not find a pattern here. I, I always look at problems like this from a very practical viewpoint. Here's, and here's, here's why. If I only had 10 items or if I only had 40 items, it would be very easy to just look at what was spent and say, whoop, you know, they, they spent $800 on a hammer. Um, that seems fraudulent. But if I've got a, if I've got um, something where I have 600 and they bought 614 items and spent 13 and a half million dollars on it, I'm going to need something that lets me sift through all that really quickly. And I guess, you know, I would say if you had 120 to anywhere from 120 to 500 items, you're really going to start to get this distribution. But that's a really good question. And I'm sorry to say, I have never seen a paper that covered sample size limitations. It's not that they're not out there. I'm sure that you could go to Google Scholar today and find 20 papers on sample size limitations for Benford's law analysis. And you would find that. I just don't know the answer to that. There, there probably is some sample size limitation. What you can see is the ones um, that we saw earlier where they only had a couple of purchases. Uh, was it the fire protection district? Nope, I think it was maybe the fire department. Nope, wasn't that police? Police department? Nope. You would hope the police department has honest numbers. We were looking at one of them anyway that only had, yeah, here we only have eight items. So clearly we don't even need this analysis to look at eight items. Um, and when we look at these eight items and we see that, you know, all the, the, well, we already know two numbers are gonna be missing if they only have eight items, right? So here we have one, six and eight, we're missing seven, seven different numbers, but that's hardly a, a cause for alarm because even at this low number, you can see it's it's sort of following the pattern a little bit. And you know you're not gonna get a distribution with just four or five observations. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Um, but just like any dashboard, it's just intended to show you to trigger further investigation, further analysis. So, yeah. You bet, yep. Yeah. Yep. So that's when I walked when I walked the uh, comptroller for the city through it. 
um, we were looking at some of these. So this has 42 items. I'm not going to be too concerned about that. This downtown development district, though, with 888 items, over $102 million spent. You know, these two numbers up here are kind of important because if there's fraud there, it's it's a big number. And um, it has enough items, 888 items. I would really expect that unless something very unusual was being bought, like they bought a whole lot of, I don't know, cars or trucks or something. And all of those trucks cost, you know, $5,000 each, I would find it really hard to believe that this distribution was consistent with Benford and that there wasn't something a little shady going on here. I'm not accusing anybody, but, you know, as, as you said, I would use this to say, uh, can I look at your books? Because there might be something weird going on here. We're, we're finding some anomalies in your numbers. I'm sorry, just one more thing. Can you right sure. click on your the number five and like actually start to look at, can you right click on that and see the actual data beneath? Oh no, no, okay. I didn't I didn't build that capability in here just because all I really built this for originally was as a proof of concept. Um, but th that would be a good feature to put into it if I were actually going to try to use it. Yeah, download the data, maybe do a pivot table to start to look at some patterns or something. Yeah. Okay. Great questions. Any others? Well, if not, then I can give you a, an extra six minutes for your presentation, Jeff. So we have a Jeff, thank you, Rip. That was very good, uh, very informative. We had some good questions and uh, comments going on in the chat. So if you haven't looked at the chat, please uh, take a, a stroll over to that and some good conversations going on there. Um, Rip, if, is this uh, presentation also available on like uh, Tableau Public or something that you're able to share if people do want to see that? If, I'm sorry. What was the question? I was looking at one of the questions in the chat. Taking <laughs> sorry, the no worries. I, um, I didn't know if the Tableau file was available to share either through uh, Tableau Public or um, something that we could put out on LinkedIn. Um, if not, it's not a problem. Um, um, thought I'd ask. Well, here, here's a question. Okay, so anybody who was paying attention probably saw what city this was. If I was going to put it out for complete publication, I might want to clean up the data to make Good sure point. <laughs> the city name isn't there. However, that was one of the reasons that I called, and the comptroller told me at that time that you know, she didn't care. However, if we are, we're actually going to put it out for public consumption, let me do that, go through there, and make sure that nobody can tell what city this came from. Um, and then we can, I'll put it up on Tableau Public. How's that? Perfect. Yep, yep. That's a good point. So, excellent. Uh, any more questions for Rick on anything? Okay. So, on our next uh, item here, I'm not going to bother sharing my screen for that, but we have uh, Jeff coming up for um, his presentation. So, Jeff, I will be quiet and turn it over to you. Perfect. Thank you, Brian. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Excellent. So this week should be coming up for everybody. So uh, today I want to talk about dashboard actions. And this came about because last user group we had. Um, so Jeff, you're breaking up just a little bit on your audio. Afraid of that. That's a little better. We'll try it. Um, please interrupt me if, if you if, if I start breaking up again, and we'll figure it out. So, yeah. So, anyways, came to a dashboard action presentation uh, due to some uh, chatter in the chat room. Uh, it's session. still pretty much breaking up, at least on my end. If everybody else can hear, I can be quiet, but it is breaking up. So, we'll give you a minute to switch, maybe. Yeah, it's breaking up for me too. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. 
We'll wait for you to get ready. Is this any better if I take out my headset? That's uh, much better from my perspective. Thanks. Uh, All right. Clearly. Oh, no. Let's go ahead and try that and hope that's better. So we are talking about actions today and dashboard actions. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to put a quick presentation together for the user group based on, uh, yeah, the like I said, the, the chat room and the chatter that we had uh, there. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I posted the link to the dashboard on Tableau Public if you want to download and follow along. And for anyone who does not know, we are going to be talking about these specific actions uh, that you can do within a dashboard or a worksheet. Uh, it's filter, highlight, uh, go to URL, go to sheet, change parameter, and change set values. Uh, so there's a lot to get through, so I'm gonna go pretty quickly uh, to make sure we have enough time to get through everything. Uh, so what you're seeing on the screen here is a workbook I put together uh, with different, uh, I, guess, I guess just uh, different options or different ways to show our uh, dashboard actions. So to start, we have this dashboard that's sales by state. And one thing I want to do is I want to, within my sales by state, if I click on a state, I wanna see the top five cities within that state and also update my map to show that as well. So that's easy enough to do if I just add a filter action to my dashboard. So I'm going to go up to my dashboard tab here and add action. And then I'm going to add a filter action. And I will go top five city. Uh, so we have the option between source sheets and target sheets. So the source sheet is what's actually going to be performing the action. If you click on something, or hover over a mark on the visualization in the source sheet, uh, that is what's going to uh, essentially run the action or affect the target sheet. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So my source sheet is gonna be sales by state because I want that to be the clickable or I want that to be the visualization that performs the action. So we will click sales by state for the source and for my target, I'm going to do my top five cities and my map. So top five cities and top five city map. So in order to run the action, I want to run this on select. And that means when I click on a mark in the visualization, or in this case, in this tree map, click on a square for the state, uh, um, that's what's going to trigger my action. So one thing I'm also going to do is my target filters I'm going to select an individual field here to run the action on. And by that, I'm just going to add my filter here and I'm going to choose the field state. And why I'm doing this is I just prefer to know that when my users are selecting this option, it's always only going to filter by state and nothing else. All right, so we have our action set up. I'll hit okay. And so now when I click on a state, I have my action that filters the top five cities uh, within California and also updates my map as well. So one thing I actually wanna do is, I don't want this information here, uh, this top five cities and top five map, unless I actually select an option up here. So one way I can do that is I can actually go to my actions, and that's dashboard, actions, and I can edit this action. What I'm actually gonna do is select this one, clearing the selection will exclude all values. So now I'll click on a map, or I'll click on a point, New York. When I unclick this, it's going to make these completely disappear. So now this data only gets populated when I select something up here. All right, so now 
we can actually incorporate the highlight action into this as well. Uh, there's a good use case. So for example, I want to select my state here in this map or in this uh, visualization. But then I also want to be able to, if a user hovers over one of these cities listed here, it'll highlight that city on the map. So we can easily accomplish this by again going to dashboard and actions. And we are going to add an action for highlight. And what we're gonna do, our source sheet is going to be this top five sheets, or um, top five cities. And the sheet that's going to be receiving the action is going to be our map over here. So that is going to be our top five city map. And I'm going to run this action on hover. Call it, give it a descriptive title, top five city highlight. And again, I'm going to make sure that it's only highlighting the field that I want it to highlight. So I'm going to specify city. OK, and OK. So now, now that I have Texas highlighted, when I hover over this, I can see on the map that the point where the city is highlighted. So that's good. As developers, we know what to do. We know that in order to kind of tell a story with this data or guide guided analytics with this data is to first click on a state and then highlight this but our user doesn't know that. So let's go ahead and add some descriptive titles here uh, to make sure our user understands that in order to, let's say, populate this area down here, they need to click on a state first and that the option is also available for them to highlight as well. So I'm gonna go click, double click on the title here in order to edit it. I'm just gonna copy and paste some text in here. Uh, there we go. Go ahead and make this a little bigger and italicize. All right, so now we have a little bit more of a description here in the title. Click on a state to see top five cities. And then within our top five cities, we'll also go ahead and add some descriptive text as well. Just to let, again, to let the user know uh, that there are actions and there is interactivity available within this dashboard. Cool, so now we tell the user, okay, click on a state. And then we're guiding the user after they click on a state to hover over a city uh, to really kind of enable the data in this dashboard to be more interactive. And we can even do things um, like drag some text up here uh, that be even more descriptive uh, that this white space will be populated uh, when the state is clicked above. And we can just kind of float that right there and everything's floating. So one problem we have with, with this is actually if you were to click on a state, you'll see that this is uh, kind of the top layer of all of our floating objects on the dashboard. So one thing we can do is actually go to our layout tab here and look at our item hierarchy. And we can rearrange the order of our objects within the dashboard. So for example, this text here, we can just Click this and drag this down to the bottom of our hierarchy. Uh, and that way, uh, there, these objects that get populated, this, this top five cities list and this map, will, uh, once they, once this sheet is selected or a state is selected, um, they'll float over top of our text that we created. So we won't have that uh, issue anymore. One fun fact as well. You can also rename these objects as well, these dashboard objects. So if you were to right click on it and rename the dashboard item, uh, you can certainly do that. Helps you keep track of things. Uh, just a fun fact that I actually didn't know until pretty recently. All right. So next we're moving forward to uh, go to URL. Uh, and this is a pretty handy, uh, dashboard action if you want to send users out to a specific web page or something like that. So for this, I have Redfin data, uh, and this, for, this was for homes sold recently in the Herndon area, and this is actually kind of where our 
uh, headquarters is for Volkswagen and Audi. So we see this and we want to be able to look at the homes sold and click on them in order to actually go to the Redfin listing for the home. So that's actually easy for us. We have the URL in our data. So we're just gonna go ahead and go to, for this example, it's actually gonna be a worksheet. Since it's at the worksheet level and not dashboard, we're gonna go worksheet actions and go to URL. And we're going to run the action on select. That means we're gonna select one of these dots and when we click on it, it'll guide us out to our default browser and it'll open up the, the Redfin listing for this house. So for our URL, we're just gonna click this little uh, carrot here to bring up the option of the different fields. And we're gonna click our URL field that's already in our data. Easy enough. Okay. And now let's look at this really expensive house here. If we click on that, oh, we actually, one thing we also have to do is our URL field. We're going to bring this into the view. And bringing the actual field into the view essentially activates it and allows it to be part of any action uh, that's part of the worksheet or the dashboard. All right, so now this is on detail. Now this is actually in the view and being used. Now we can use this URL field. So let's go ahead and click on this point here. And there we go. And my Google Chrome browser, it popped up for this house that's a little over a million dollars in the Herndon area. So if, if anyone's on the market. A little house for a million dollars, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> even in Northern Virginia. <laughs> All right, so next example for go to URL, uh, we have some NBA player data. It is a little bit old, but it is points per game uh, for the NBA players and what I want to show you is you can actually create a URL from a calculated field if one is not already in your data. So that Redfin example, we already had the URL uh, listed in our data set. This one we do not. However, for me, if I would want the ability to click on a player and go to, let's say, their Wikipedia page. Uh, and that's pretty easy. If we go to like LeBron James Wikipedia. All right, here we go. And we can see Wikipedia structures all their URLs the same way, in which case there's just gonna be this HTTPS, Wikipedia, and then it's going to have the listing of the player name. So we can actually, if we know that the URL is gonna be the same structure, we're just gonna copy and paste this first part of it and create a calculated field here. And we'll call this URL. And we will go ahead and paste this as just text in quotation marks. And then assign, and we'll bring in our player. So this is the first and last name of the player. And okay. Drag this out to detail. And now we can do the same thing. Uh, worksheet actions, uh, go to URL. We're going to run action on select. The source sheet is our sheet here. And we're going to use that URL calculated field that we just created, which essentially is the, the text uh, URL link with our player name. We're gonna hit okay. And now if we click on something like Bradley Beal, we'll get Bradley Beal's Wikipedia page uh, just from our creating our URL. Okay, so the next action is the go to sheet action. And this is, my opinion, kind of one of the, the weaker uh, dashboard actions that you can do. Uh, it is pretty self explanatory. You just go from one sheet to another or from one dashboard to another. Uh, and Tableau has since come up with some other ways to do this as well, specifically uh, navigation buttons, which you see here. And other things, but we'll we'll take a look at how to do it uh, just to cover all the bases. So we have our sales by state dashboard here, and we are just going to click dashboard actions, 
and go to sheet. And so our source sheet is going to be our state sales, which we have here. Our target sheet is going to be the dashboard month sales. And we'll run action on select. So we'll click OK. And once we click anywhere in this dashboard, it will take us to uh, this other dashboard for month sales. Uh, for me, I actually think there is a better option. This is a better use case for a filter action. So if you don't know, filter actions can actually navigate between dashboard sheets uh, as well as set up the initial filter. So instead of just navigating, clicking on a state and navigating to that monthly sales dashboard, what we could do is go to our actions, remove our go to sheet action. We're gonna add a filter uh, on select and our source sheet is going to be our sales by state, this one here. Our target sheet is actually going to be on a completely different dashboard. And we're able to just click on this drop down uh, and navigate to that. So our target sheet is gonna be our month sales. And okay. And now when we click on a sheet, not only does it navigate us to that other dashboard, it actually pre-filters this dashboard based on our selection. So this is showing our sales by month for just the state of Texas. Or we can do something again, go back and do something like New York. So another good use case for the filter option. Sorry, I just, I just noticed that there's a couple um, questions in the chat or just uh, chat optics. I wanted to take a look to make sure there weren't any questions. Uh, if there are, just feel free to interrupt me. All right, so next we're getting into the parameter and set actions. And these are probably some of the more powerful actions that Tableau has come out with uh, pretty recently within the last year or two. Uh, and you can do a lot of different things with these, uh, the changing the, the set, the changing parameters and changing sets. So specifically around parameters, I would say this is huge as far as giving more interactivity into your for your users. Uh, so for example, the first thing I want to show you for parameter action is actually going to be creating a dynamic reference line. Uh, so first thing we want to do here is actually going to be to create our parameter. Oh, not here, we're going to create this and create parameter. And we're going to call this uh, threshold. Go All right, and our data type is going to be float. I think everything is okay here. Uh, and now we're going to add our reference line. So we're gonna go to analytics and have our reference line here. And we're gonna put it at the table level for our sum of sales. And you can see this is already created on our visualization, but we're going to change some of the options here. Specifically for our value, we're actually going to pick the parameter that we just created, threshold. So not only that you can, you can choose a specific value in your field, like you saw some of sales, uh, you can also choose parameters as your threshold for reference lines. This is all very good old school Tableau. You could do this before, uh, just the interactivity piece of it that you'll see here with the dashboard action is really what sets it apart. Uh, so for our label here, we're gonna choose value and you'll see the current label is threshold. Uh, we are actually going to change that to value. And so that gives us our value of one, which is what we set our parameter to when we just created it. And that's perfectly fine. Okay. And so now we actually wanna to start to create the parameter action. So we'll go up to worksheet and actions and change parameter. And we'll call this uh, threshold as well. I think I spelled that right. Uh, so we're actually gonna run this action on hover. 
And what this is going to do is change the reference line based on where the user is hovering on the visualization. So our target parameter is going to be the threshold parameter that we just created. And our field is going to be sum of sales, which is what we're using for our axis, our y-axis here on the visualization. All right, so let's click OK. And now the parameter will automatically update wherever the user is hovering. And you could see that reference line across the entire visualization, which is showing the sales by month over the years for each segment. All right, so you can get into some pretty uh, detailed things with, with these uh, parameter and set actions. Like I said, they're very powerful. Uh, how am I doing on time? 6.30. So one thing I want to show you guys is actually creating a toggle switch using a parameter action. Um, so we have this nice dashboard here, and we have this table of our data, and it's uh, sales by by date or uh, sales by year uh, split by region. And we know as developers that as a visualization, it would be so much better, but this dashboard is out to our executive and they love the table view and they wanna keep the table, yada, yada. I think we've been through that conversation a hundred times as Tableau developers, they just want the data. All right, so my solution to this is just give them both. Sure, they can have this table, but let's go ahead and create a toggle switch here that allows them to not only see the table, but when they click the switch to see a visualization as well behind this data. All right, so first things first, we're gonna go ahead and create our parameter that we're gonna use for the parameter action. I'm gonna create this. It's actually created already, and I'll show you how to do that. But it's just our show table, and our data type is Boolean, and our default value is going to be false. All right, so now we actually need to create a new data source all, all together to work our toggle switch. So I don't know if any of you are aware, but you can actually copy and paste data directly into Tableau as a new data source. I'm pulling up Excel right now, and I'm just going to create a really quick data set here. My column header is me toggle, and my values are gonna be either true or false. I'm just going to copy and paste this, or copy it and paste it directly into Tableau. And give it a second. There we go. We just took whatever data we had in Excel and just copied and pasted it directly into Tableau as a usable data source. All right. So next thing we want to do is create a calculated field off of this. And it's going to be called the next toggle. And again, this is just a quick data source to give us a Boolean result on the actual toggle switch itself. So for our calculative field, we are going to, I'll copy and paste this in, but essentially saying if our toggle is true result, uh, then actually false, else true and end. What we're essentially going to do now is create the toggle switch via using a shape. And when we do that, we're going to have essentially a true and a false on top of each other. And this calculated field will allow us to distinguish between either a true or a false value. And let me show you how that works because I know that might be a bit confusing. So we're gonna clear this sheet. And we're actually going to create an ad hoc calculation here on columns. And we're just going to type in zero and hit enter. 
Uh, and now we have our kind of quote unquote ad hoc data point that we're going to create our shape off of. Uh, but now we need to format this a little bit to get rid of all these extra lines and things that we don't need. So I'm going to right click and format. And we are going to get rid of any grid lines, any zero lines, axis rulers, and axis ticks. We want nothing in the background. And we are actually going to right click on our header, our axis, and unclick show header. So all we're going to have on the sheet here is this little data point, which is our sum of zero. We'll change our visualization type to shape. And we're gonna drag this toggle field on a shape. So now you see we have our true and false options and they're kind of what you think of now is they're stacked on top of each other. You can almost see it where you could get like a true and a false here. I don't know if it's coming through very well on the presentation, on the Zoom presentation, but that's why we are going to create our action here. First, we're actually going to do a filter action to distinguish between either true or false values here. Before we do that, we're actually gonna add a shape or add a image to our shapes. So one thing I've done already is to set up two toggle switch images in my shapes. Uh, and there are countless, um, if, if you're not sure how to add custom shapes to Tableau, there are countless blogs and posts and articles. Uh, just Google it. Uh, it's super easy to do. I won't get into it on this call, but um, let me know or just Google search it. Like I said, plenty of resources out there. And so with this, we're going to assign our data points different shapes or different shape images. Hit OK. We'll make these larger. All right, now it's looking kind of like a toggle switch. So before we do anything with this, we are going to set up a worksheet action and a filter. And on select, we are going to tell this to either show a true or a false value to show the proper image of the, the toggle switch either essentially consider this as on activated or off. So we'll call this toggle action. All right, we'll run it on select. And this is the tricky part here for our source field. We're going to use the field next toggle, the calculated field we created. But for the actual target field, we're going to use toggle. So with each of these options, it's either going to be true, false, or false, true. All right, and now we can see that we, oh, and the next toggle to detail. And again, that's just activating it in the view here. So now we can see with our action, and once we click on it, maybe, maybe not. Let's check things here. Put next toggle and toggle. We'll keep an eye on that, but we'll want a true value when the toggle is clipped at some point. Uh, but let's keep going and see if that works or not. All right, so let's go back to our table and let's bring in a floating object. And this is going to be our toggle switch, our sheet 17. We will hide the title. Change this to entire view and make this object a little smaller. All right, here's our switch. And then we will also drag our visualization into here. So what this is, is just a, a uh, container, I think it's a vertical container that has our data table 
And we're just, we have this other visualization that we're gonna drag into here as well. And I'm sure some of you have used things like a sheet swapping parameter or, or something like that to shop the swap between two sheets uh, within a container. Uh, if you do that, unfortunately, you have to hide the titles, which is something that Tableau, that, that's just kind of what Tableau requires in order to, to do this functionality, which is, which is okay, because we will have some room up here for a title if we need it. Um, so we're gonna hide the title on both of our visualizations, our sheets here within our container. And we're gonna go ahead and go to dashboard actions and set up a parameter action. All right, and we will toggle between tables. And our switch is going to be our sheet 17. That's our toggle. Our target parameter is going to be our show table. And let's remember our parameter that's a true and false Boolean. And then our value field is going to be next toggle. Okay, and okay. And then our last step here is going to be to actually uh, essentially activate that parameter within the visualization. So right now we have everything set up. We have our parameter action set up and we have parameters uh, to change the values, but our visualization here doesn't reference that parameter at all. So in order to change that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a calculated field. And we'll call this, let's see, parameter filter. And we're just going to bring in this parameter that we created, our show table, into the calculated field. And then this calculated field will drag onto filters. And what this is, now we have our parameter activated within our visualization. So our show table filter, when it's false, or when our, um, our kind of trigger or toggle is turned off or turned on, we'll show the visualization. Toggle table. So we're going to go to our table view, our table sheet, and drag the same filter onto there. There it is. We're going to say true. So we have the same filter. So when our parameter value is equal to true, this will show up. If our parameter value is equal to false, the visualization will show up. And you're seeing that right now with our, with our parameter set to true, we don't see our visualization here. So now, normally what would happen is this toggle would work and it would toggle between the table and the visualization. For some reason, of course, live demos always happens. Uh, we are not getting the proper results on this toggle action. Which is fine, uh, we'll keep moving along. I know we're running short on time. Uh, so I do have the solutions workbook here that we'll send out as well. So I have a starter workbook and a solutions that uh, you can work off of and this is being recorded. Uh, so please uh, go back and check things out. But I will pull this up just very quickly to prove to you that I am not a fraud <laughs> and that this toggle does work. Maybe if Tableau decides to load. All right, here we go. So we had our dashboard. When the toggle is not activated, we'll have the table. When you do click the toggle, it'll move over to our visualization, which has the exact same data. All right. 
uh, as we round out the evening, I wanted to talk to you guys about set actions. And set actions are probably the most powerful action that you can do within Tableau. It's, it's very powerful once you understand kind of how to use it and different use cases for it. It took me a long time to kind of come up with some specific use cases uh, for set actions. But when I got used to them and when I had some use cases and understood exactly what I was doing, uh, I kind of understood the power uh, that I could have within my dashboards and user interactivity within the dashboard. Um, so very cool. I'll go over a couple of uh, examples of these and how to use them. And then we will see kind of what time we have left, uh, what questions we have, uh, and I can continue on after that if, if we want to. So the first option we have with the changing of sets is going to be around, uh, I guess what you call color scaling is I think the word that Tableau uses or, or that the visualization community uses. So we have a map here of all the countries um, colored by population, by most population. So we're looking here and my problem with this is China is so populous or some countries are so populous that they offset the rest of the data and for example, if I want to look at just Africa and see the population differences within the countries in Africa, it's very hard for me to do that here. Um, so one way we can solve that is with set actions. So we are going to go to worksheet and actions, and we will create a set. Actually, before we do that, I want to make sure I do have country set already created. And this is just a set that I created by going to our country and region field and create set. And really when we're going to use this as an action, because the, we allow for the user to select and this user interactivity to change the set values, that really any values we have in this initial set that we create are kind of arbitrary. Because anything we show here uh, is just probably going to be updated or changed by the user and, and what they want to see. So we'll just click OK. OK. So we're going to create a calculated field here uh, that's just going to just confirm or just tell Tableau essentially that we are going to use this country set and that we still want the, the population of these countries colored accordingly. So it's just gonna be a population by country calculated field. Uh, and we're just making sure that Tableau is going to color based on the values that are in the country set that we just created. Um, I'll just pop population, I can't type by country. Okay. And so this that we just created, can go on to color. And we're not gonna see a change because all of our countries are selected in this set. Uh, but what we would see a change if we selected only certain countries within our set. Uh, and that would show the total population for the, uh, the countries with it with selected within the set. So that's what we're going to use. However, we're going to create this set action, allow users to do that. So let's go ahead and do that. So worksheet actions, uh, set actions or change set values. And we'll go ahead and create this based on select and our target set or the set that's going to be changing or that we're going to allow the users to interactively change the values is going to be our country set. So, okay. And remember the use case of why we did this is again, these, these more populous countries are kind of skewing the rest of the results. Um, and we wanna see just the populations and analyze just the populations within Africa. One thing we can do that is we can actually highlight this. And now with our set action, I kind of grabbed a lot of countries here, but we'll be able to 
change the color and analyze just our selection. So for example, we see that Nigeria is the most populous country in Africa. And it's a lot easier to see that variation between the rest in this view compared to, of course, seeing everything. All right, so another good use case for set actions is gonna be what we call propor proportional brushing. So for example, we have this, these two bar charts and it is uh, our sales by subcategory and our sales by segment. And what we wanna be able to do is within our subcategories here, um, see how much of sales were in the consumer segment or the corporate segment or the home office segment. So one thing we're going to do here is we will go ahead and create a set on segment. Da, 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 you are around there somewhere, there you are. So we're gonna go right, right, right click on the segment field over here and create set. And uh, we'll just call it consumer for now. But again, this is uh, slightly arbitrary because we're gonna be allowing the user to select uh, the options in the set. All right, so we have our set here. Uh, I forgot the name, and it's just gonna be called set one for now. Uh, but we're gonna drag this set one over to color. And because we set up our segment set to show consumer, now we are seeing that 169,000 of sales is consumer-based versus the other two. And then it'll be easier to see on this. So now we have our subcategory to show the blue bar is segment, or sorry, the blue bar is consumer. Uh, the gray bar is the other two, corporate and home office. So now we can create a, a set action and allow our user to actually change that. All right, so we will create dashboard action, change set values and proportional brushing. All right, so our source sheet is going to be the segment bar. Uh, that's what we want actually uh, to initiate the action. And then we'll do it on select. And our target set is going to be our set one that we created. Okay, and okay. And now we're able to just change the set values um, with the action. So if we wanted to see corporate, now we're seeing the sales in corporate versus the other segments. Uh, for example, compared to home office, which now we're seeing the sales of home office by phone compared to the other segments. So definitely allows that interactivity to see a little bit more granularity in your in your data. Okay, so I went through a lot and I know we have about eight minutes left of time. So I wanted to open it up with any questions, uh, comments, anything that anyone wants me to go over again. Uh, yes, a formula. I think a formula could be created to drive the parameter uh, instead of parsing from Excel. I think you could create a calculated field and do that. Uh, partially the reason why I chose to do Excel uh, was just to also show that you can copy and paste data into Tableau, which is kind of a fun fact that I learned not that long ago. Hey, Jeff, this is uh, Paul Albert. Uh, great presentation. I did have one um, small observation for the first sheet that we started with, the sales by state. It's uh, pretty easy to adjust your title text so that it tells you what the, what the selection was. So if you're doing something that's pretty involved and your user is clicking on lots of things, you're able to get your headline to say, well, you chose California. 
you know, in this case, and it just helps them do a breadcrumb trail to see what their actions have been in interpreting the dashboard. And I love that hierarchy tip. Definitely. And insert, let's see if we can, our state field. So there you go, something like that. And definitely a good lesson on, on making headers as interactive as possible as well. Uh, if you're gonna have a dashboard that's gonna have a lot of interactivity, like we showed today with a lot of the dashboard actions, uh, filtering, et cetera, then it helps to have descriptive titles um, so your users don't get lost and just kind of clicking away on your dashboard. All right, do I have any other questions out there? Hey, Jeff, this was great. Um, appreciate you doing the presentation. Um, here, I'll pop my video back on here. Maybe my cat will be in the picture. I don't know if she's way over here. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, if anybody does have any other questions, feel free to pipe in and let us know. We appreciate um, everybody participating. Um, particularly appreciate Rip and Jeff for uh, presenting today. Um, I learned a lot and always do in these sessions. So um, even though I'm one of the, the leaders of the group, I think I'm probably one of the less experienced ones uh, in using Tableau. So I'm always, always learning and like to play around and see what I can uh, get from this. So um, in the chat uh, items, if you haven't looked at chat, there were several good questions and comments. So please uh, try to take a look at that quickly before the um, session's over. But um, I did post a link to the uh, LinkedIn page for our group that you can go to. And um, I think just let's see real quickly here if I can grab my screen. Um, there we go. So I do have the, the page here. So if you go to that, you can see when you scroll through, we've got our other um, videos and so forth listed in here and any of the posts that any of the members have uh, uh, populated on here. So if you're not um, on our LinkedIn page, it's a great way to keep in touch with us. Um, please uh, feel free to join if you are. Great. Thank you for joining. Um, to be honest, I don't go through to look at all who's uh, on the group, but I just wanted to make sure I uh, shared that and it's a good way if you want to reach out to any of us to connect to us. Um, I could, I guess, also plug my um, email address on here uh, if folks want to reach out to me that way or you can um, reach out to me through responding to the um, Splash emails that I send out for invites, so that will come back directly to us uh, on the leadership team as well. So, um, but I did just put my work email. That's what I use for my primary stuff as well. So, till the company yells at me for using the company email, I'll keep doing it until then. So, um, but I will give it another moment too. If anybody has a question, feel free to pipe in uh, real quickly. <laughs> 